a bitter root billing serbiter. By Rex Ellingwood Beach. Billings rode in from the junction about dusk, and ate his supper in silence. He'd been east for sixty days, and, although there lurked about him the hint of unwanted ventures, etiquette forbade its mention. You see, in our country, that which a man gives voluntarily is oftimes later dissected in smoky bunkhouses, or roughly handled round flickering campfires, but the privacies he guards are inviolate. Curiosity isn't exactly a lost art but its practice isn't popular nor hygienic. Later, I found him meditatively whittling out on the porch, and, as the moment seemed propitious, I inquired adroitly, did you have a good time in Chicago, Bitterroot? Bully, said he, relapsing into weighty absorption. What did you do? I inquired with almost the certainty of appearing insistent. Don't you never read the papers, he inquired, with such evident compassion that Kink Martin and the other boys snickered. This from Bitterroot, who scorns literature outside of the Arkansas printing, as he terms the illustrations. Guess I'll have to show you my press notices, and from a hip pocket he produced a fat bundle of clippings in a rubber band. These he displayed jealously, and I stared agape, for they were front pages of great metropolitan dailies marred with red and black scare heads, in which I glimpsed the words, Billings, of Montana, bitter root on arbitration, a lokinva out of the West, and other things as puzzling. Press notices, echoed Kink scornfully. Wouldn't that rope ye? He talks like Big Ike that went with the Wild West show. When a puncher gets so lazy he can't earn a living by the sweat of his pony, he grows his hair goes on the stage busting glass balls with shot C.A. tridges and talks about press notices. Let's see M, Billings. You pinch M as close to your stomach as though you held cards in a strange poker game. Well, I have set in a strange game, amongst aliens, said Billings, disregarding the request, and I've held the high cards, also I've drawn out with honours. I've sailed the medium high seas with mutiny in the stokehold, I've changed the laws of labor, politics, and municipal economies. I went out of God's country right into the heart of the decaying East, and by the application of a running noose in a hemp rope I strangled oppression and put eight thousand men to work. He paused ponderously. I'm an arbitrator. The deuce you are, indignantly cried Reddy the cook. Who says so? Reddy isn't up in syntax, and his unreasoning loyalty to Billings is an established fact of such standing that his remarks afford no conjecture. Yes, I've cut into the nation's peril and the crying evil good and strong walking out from the stinks of the Union stockyards, of Chicago, into the limelight of publicity, via the drunk and disorderly route. You see I got those ten carloads of steers into the city all right, but I was so blame busy splattering through the tracked up wastes of the cow pens, and inhaling the sore gas of the west side that I never got to see a newspaper. If I'd a read one, here's what I'd a found, namely, the greatest, stubbornest, riotinest strike ever known, which means a heap for Chicago, she being the wet nurse of labor trouble. The whole river front was tied up. Nary a steamer had whistled inside the six-mile crib for two weeks, and eight thousand men was out. There was hold-ups and bloodshedding and picketing, which last is an alias for assault with intents, and altogether it was a prime place for a cowman, on a quiet vacation just homelike and natural. It was at this point that I enters, busting out of the smoke of the stockyards, all sweet and beautiful, like the gentle heroine in the play as she walks through the curtains at the back of the stage. Now you know there's a heap of difference between the stockyards and Chicago it's just like coming from Arkansas over into the United States. Well, soon as I sold the stock I hit for the lake front and began to ground sluice the cold dust off of my pallet. I was busy working my booze hydraulic when I see an arid appear in Pilgrim Longside looking thirsty as an alkali flat. 
Get in, says I, and the way he obeyed orders looked like he'd had military training. I felt sort of draught to him from the way he handled his liquor, took it straight and running over, then sopped his hands on the bar and smelled of his fingers. He seemed to just soak it up both ways regular human blotter. You lap it up like a man, says I, like a cowman fool groat ever been west. Nope, says he, born here. Well I'm a stranger, says I, out absorbing such beauties of architecture and free lunch as offers along the line. If I ain't keeping you up, I'd be glad of your company. I'm your assistant lunch buster, says he, and in the course of things he further explained that he was a tugboat fireman, out on a strike, giving me the following information about the tie-up. It all come up over a dose of dyspepsia. Back up, interrupted Kink squirming, are you plumb bug? Get together. You're certainly the raving kid. You must have stone bruised your heel and got concession of the brain. Yes sir. Indigestion, Billings continued. Old man Badrich, of the Badrich Transportation Company has it terrible. It lands on his solar every morning about nine o'clock get in worse steady, and reaches perihelion along about eleven. He can tell the time of day by taste. One morning when his mouth felt like about 10.45 in comes a committee from firemen and engineers local number 21, with a demand for more wages, prodded in him with the intimations that if he didn't ante they'd tie up all his boats. I suppose a teaspoonful of barking soda, assimilated internally around the environments of his appendix would have spared the strike and cheated me out of being a hero. As the poet might have said upon such slender pegs is this, our greatness hung. Oh, good, exclaimed Mulling, piously. Anyhow, the bitterness in the old man's inner tubes showed in the bile of his answer, and he told them if they wanted more money he'd give them a chance to earn it they could work nights as well as days. He intimated further that they'd ought to be satisfied with their wages as they'd undoubtedly follow the same line of business in the next world, and wouldn't get a cent for feed in the fires neither. Next morning the strike was called, and the guy that breathed treachery and walkouts was one oily he gan, further submerged under the titles of President of the Federation of Fresh Water Firemen also chairman of the United Waterfront Workmen, which last takes in everything doing business along the river except the wharf rats and typhoid germs, and it's with the disreputableness of this party that I infected myself to the detriment of labor and the triumph of the law. D. Tahara Higan is an able man, and inside of a week he'd spread the strike till it was the cleanest, dirtiest tie-up ever known. The hospitals and morgues was full of non-union men, but the river was empty all right. Yes, he had a persuading method of arbitration quite convincing to the most calloused, involving the laying on of the lead pipe. Things got to be pretty fierce by and by, for they had the police buffaloed, and disturbances got plentier than the casualties at a butcher's picnic. The strikers got hungry, too, finally, because the principles of unionism is like a rash on your mechanic, skin deep inside, his gastrics works three shifts a day even if his outsides is idle and steaming with socialism. Oily fed M. Dre loads of eloquence, but it didn't seem to be real filling. They'd leave the lectures and rob a bakery. He was a wonder though, just sat in his office, and kept the ship owners waiting in line, swearing bitter and refined cuss words about ignorant fiend and cussed pedagogue which last, for Kink's enlightenment, means a kind of Hebrew meeting house. These here details my new friend give me, ending with a eulogy on Oily Hegan, the idol of the idol. If he says starve, we starve, says he, and if he says work, we work. See? Oh he's the goods, he is. Let's go down by the river meb we'll see him. So me and Murdoch hiked down Water Street, where they keep mosquito netting over the bar fixtures and spit at the stove. We found him, 
a big-mouthed, shifty, kind of man, about as cynical looking in the face as a black bass, and full of wind as a toad fish. I exchanged drinks for principles of socialism, and doing so happened to display my role. Murdoch slipped away and made talk with a friend, then, when Hegan had left, he steers me out the back way into an alley. Shortcut, says he to another and a better place. I follows through a back room, then as I steps out the door I'm grabbed by this new friend, while Murdoch bathes my head with a gas pipe billy, one of the regulation, strike promoting kind, like they use for decoying members into the glorious ranks of labor. I saw a burning of Rome that was a dream, and whole cloud bursts of shooting stars, but I yanked Mr. Enthusiastic Stranger away from my surcingle and throwed him agin the wall. In the shuffle Murdoch shifts my ballasts though, and steams up the alley with my greenbacks, convoyed by his friend. Wow wow, says I, giving the distress signal so that the windows rattled, and rear chin for my holster. I'd a got them both, only the gun caught in my suspender. You see, not anticipating any live bird shoot I'd put it inside my pants band, under my vest, for appearances. A fortify is like fresh air to a drowning man generally has to be draught in haste and neither one shouldn't be mislaid. I got her out at last and blazed away, just a second after they dodged around the comer. Then I hit the trail after M, letting go a few sky shots and getting a ghost dance holler off my stomach that had been troubling me. The wallop on the head made me dizzy though, and I zigzagged awful, tacking out of the alley right into a policeman. We says I enjoy, for he had Murdoch safe by the bits, bucking considerable. Stan aside and learn me electrocute him, says I. I throwed the gun on him and the crowd dogged it into all the doorways and windows convenient, but I was so weak-minded in the knees I stumbled over the curb and fell down. Next thing I knew we was all bouncing over the cobblestones in a patrol wagon. Well, in the morning I told my story to the judge, plain and unvarnished. Then Murdoch takes the stand and busts into song, claiming that he was coming through the alley toward Clark Street when I staggered out back of a saloon and commenced to shoot at him. He saw I was drunk, and fanned out, me shooting at him with every jump. He had proof, he said, and he called for the president of his union, Mr. Hegan. At the name all the loafers and stewbums in the courtroom stomped and said, here, here, while up steps this Napoleon of the hobos. Sure, he knew Mr. Murdoch had known him for years, and he was perfectly reliable and honest. As to his robbing me, it was preposterous, because he himself was at the other end of the alley and saw the whole thing, just as Mr. Murdoch related it. I jumps up. You're a liar, he gan. I was buying booze for the two of you, but a policeman nailed me, choking off my rhetorics. Mr. Hegan leans over and whispers to the judge, while I got chillblains along my spine. Look here, kind judge, says I real winning and genteel, this man is so good at explaining things away, ask him to talk off this bump over my ear. I surely didn't get a buggy spoke and laminate myself on the nut. That'll do, says the judge. Mr. Clark, ten dollars, and costs charge, drunk and disorderly. Next. Hold on there, says I, ignorant of the involutions of justice, I guess I've got the bulge on you this time. They beat you to me, judge. I ain't got a cent. You can go through me and be welcome to half you find. I'll mail you ten when I get home though, honest. At that the audience giggled, and the judge says. Your humor doesn't appeal to me, Billings. Of course, you have the privilege of working it out. Oh, glory, the privilege. Hegan nodded at this, and I realized what I was against. Your honor, says I with sarcastic refinements, science tells us that a perfect vacuum ain't possible, but after watching you I know better, and for you, Mr. Workingman's friend, us to the floor, and I run at Hegan. Sure. I never got started, nor I didn't rightfully come to till I rested in the workhouse, which last figure of speech is a pure and beautiful paradox.
I ain't well in with glee on the next 26 days $10 and costs, at 4 bits a day, but I left there saturated with such hatreds for Hegan that my breath smelted of M. I wanders down the riverfront, hoping the fortunes of war would deliver him to me dead or alive, when the thought hit me that I'd need money. It was bound to take another 10 and costs shortly after we met, and probably more, if I paid for what I got, for I figured on distending myself with satisfaction and his features with uppercuts. Then I see a sign, non-union men wanted big wages. In I goes, and strains my language through a wire net at the cashier. I want them big wages, says I. What can you do? Anything to get the money, says I, what does it take to liquidate an assault on a labor leader? There was a white-haired man in the cage who began to sit up and take notice. What's your trouble, says he, and I told him. If we had a few more like you, we'd bust the strike, says he, kind of sizzing me up. I've got a notion to try it anyhow, and he smites the desk. Collins what do ye say if we tow the Detroit out? Her crew has stayed with us so far, and they'll stick now if we'll say the word. The unions are hungry and scrapping among themselves, and the men want to go back to work. It's just that devil of a hegan that holds em. If they see we've got a tug crew that'll go, they'll arbitrate, and we'll kill the strike. Yes, sir, says Collins, but where's the tug crew, Mr. Badrich? Right here. We three, and Murphy, the bookkeeper. Blast this idleness. I want to fight. I'll take the same, says I, when I get the price. That's all right. You've put the spirit into me, and I'll see you through. Can you run an engine? Good. I'll take the wheel, and the others will fire. It's going to be risky work, though. You won't back out, eh? Reddy interrupted Billings here loudly, with a snort of disgust, while Bitterroot ran his fingers through his hair before continuing. Martin was listening intently. The old man arranged to have a squad of cops on all the bridges, and I begin anticipating hilarities for next day. The news got out of course, through the secrecies of police headquarters, and when we ran up the river for our tow, it looked like every striker west of Pittsburgh had his family on the docks to see the barbecue, accompanied by enough cobblestones and scrap iron to ballast a battleship. All we got going up was repartee, but I figured we'd need Armageddon back. We passed a hawser to the Detroit, and I turned the gas into the tug, blowing for the Wells Street Bridge. Then war began. I leans out the door just in time to see the mob charge the bridge. The cops clubbed him back, while a roar went up from the docks and rooftops that was like a bad dream. I couldn't see her move none though, an old man Badrich blowed again expurgating himself of as nabby a line of cuss words as you'll muster outside the kettle belt. Soak em, I yells, give em all the arbitration you've got handy. If she don't open, we'll jump her, and I lets out another notch, so that we went ploughing and boiling towards the draw. It looked like we'd have to her do it sure enough, but the police beat the crowd back just in time. She wasn't clear open though, and our barge caromed off the spiles. It was like a nigger but in a persimmon tree we rattled off a shower of missiles like an abnormal hailstorm. Talk about your coast defence, they heaved everything at us from bad names to railroad iron, and we lost all our window glass the first clatter, while the smokestack looked like a pretzel with cramps. When we scraped through I looked back with pity at the Detroit's crew. She hadn't any wheelhouse, and the helmsman was due to get all the attention that was coming to him. They'd built up a barricade of potato sacks, chicken coops, and bicay brack around the wheel that protected them somewhat, but even while I watched, some Polak filtered a brick through and laid out the quartermaster cold, and he was drug off. Oh. It was refined and aesthetic. Well, we run the gauntlet, presented every block with stuff ranging in tensile strength from insults to asphalt pavements, and noise, say, all the racket in the world was a whisper. I caught a glimpse of the old man leaning out of the pilot house, where a window had been, his white hair bristly, and his nostrils achisted, 
embellishing the air with surprising flights of gleeful profanity. Hooray! This is living he yells, spying me shoveling the deck out from under the junk. Best scrap I've had in years, and just then some baseball player throwed him from center field, catching him in the neck with a tomato. Gee! That man's an honor to the faculty of speech. I was doing bully till a cobblestone bounced into the engine room, marking a billiard with my off knee, then I got kind of peevish. Rush Street Bridge is the last one, and they'd mass there on both sides, like fleas on a razorback. Thinks I, if we make it through here, we've busted the strike, and I glances back at the Detroit just in time to see her crew pulling their captain into the deck house, limp and bleeding. The barricade was all knocked to pieces and they'd flunked absolute. Don't blame him much either, as it was sure death to stand out in the open under the rain of stuff that come from the bridges. Of course with no steering she commenced to swing off. I jumps out the far side of the engine room and yells fit to bust my throat. Grab that wheel. Grab it quick we'll hit the bridge, but it was like deef and dumb talk in a boiler shop, while a wilder howl went up from the waterfront as they seen what they'd done and smelled victory. There's an awfulness about the voice of a blood-maddened club swinging mob, it lifts your scalp like a fright wig, particularly if you are the cluby. We've got one chance, thinks I, but if she strikes we're gone. They'll swamp us sure, and all the police in Cook County won't save enough for to hold services on. Then I throwed a look at the opening ahead and the pessimism's froze in me. I forgot all about the resiliency of brickbats and the table manners of riots, for there, on top of a bunch of spiles, C.A.M., masterful and bloated with perjuries, was oily he gandicted in the disposition of his forces, the light of victory in his shifty, little eyes. Ten dollars and costs, I shrieks, seeing red. Let me crawl up them spiles to you. Then inspiration seized me. My soul rees up and grappled with the crisis, for right under my mighty, coiled, suggestive and pleading, was one of the tug's having lines, bout a three-eighths size. I slips a running knot in the end and divides the coils, crouching behind the deck house till we come a beam of him, then I straightened, give it a swinging heave, and the noose sailed up and settled over him fine and daisy. I jerked back. An oily Hegan did a high dive from Rush Street that was a geometrical joy. He hit kind of amateurish, doing what we used to call a belly buster back home, but quite satisfying for a maiden effort, and I reeled him in a stern. Your Chicago man ain't a gamey fish. He come up tame and squirting sewage like a dissolute porpoise, while I played him out where he'd get the thrash of the propeller. Help, he yells, I'm a drowning. Ten dollars and costs, says I, letting him under again. Do you know who you're drinking with this time, hey? I reckon the astonishment of the mob was equal to Hegan's, anyhow I'm told that we was favoured with such quietness that my voice sounded for blocks, simply aching with satisfactions. Then pandemonium tore loose, but I was so engrossed in sweet converse I never heard it or noticed that the Detroit had slid through the drawer by a hair and we was bound for the blue and smilling lake. For God's sake, let me up, says he gan, splashing along and looking strangly. I hauls him in where he wouldn't miss any of my ironies, and says. I just can't do it, oily it's wash day. You're plumb nasty with boycotts and picketings and compulsory arbitrations. I'm going to clean you up, and I sozzled him under like a wet shirt. I drug him out again and continues. This is Chinaman's work, oily, but I lost my pride in the bride well, thanks to you. It's tough on St. Louis to laundry you upstream this way, but maybe the worst of your heresies LL be purified when they get that far. You know the Chicago River runs uphill out of Lake Michigan through the drainage canal and into the St. Louis waterworks. Sure it does most unnatural stream I ever see about direction and smells. I was getting a good deal of enjoyment and infections out of him when old man Badrich ran back enameled with blood and passed tomato juice, the red in his white hair mark in his top look like one of these fancy ice cream drinks you get at a soda fountain. Here. Here. You'll kill him, says he, 
so I hauled him aboard, drip pin and clingy, wringing him out good and thorough by the neck. He made a fine mop. These clippings, continued Bitterroot, fishing into his pocket, tell in beautiful figures how the last scene of Oily Hegan he was holystoning the deck of a sooty little tugboat under the admonishments and feet of Bitterroot Billings of Montana, and they state how the strikers tried to get tugs for pursuit and couldn't, and how, all day long, from the house tops was visible a tugboat madly cruising about inside the outer cribs, bust in the silence with joyful blasts of victory, and They'll further state that about dark she steamed up the river, tired and draggled, with a boner looking cowboy in her cigarettes on the stern bits, holding a three foot knotted rope in his lap. When a delegation of strikers met her, inquiring about 1D, Ahara Higan, it says like this, and Billings read laboriously as follows. Then the bronzed and lanky man arose with a smile of rare contentment, threw overboard his cigarette, and approaching the boiler room hatch, called loudly, come out of that, and the president of the Federation of Fresh Water Firemen dragged himself wearily out into the flickering lights. He was black and drenched and streaked with sweat, also, he shone with the grease and oils of the engines, while the palms of his hands were covered with painful blisters from unwanted, intimate contact with shovels and drawbars. It was seen that he winced fearfully as the cowboy twirled the rope end. He's got the markings of a fair fireman, said the stranger, all he wants is practice. Then, as the delegation murmured angrily, he held up his hand and, in the ensuing silence, said. Boys, the strike's over. Mr. Hegan has arbitrated.